So now continuing right where we left off, we established the main sort of criteria that make a mollusca a mollusca. And those were stated in one, two, three, sometimes maybe even four with the mantle, uh, key characteristics or parts that all mollusca have. Let's look at the three major clades that are of importance when we're studying uh, Gen Bio 116. And the three major clades are as follows. So let's do three major clades. And remember, clades are just groups of organisms that have a true common ancestor uh, within them, uh, somewhere in their evolutionary history, as opposed to grades. Grades are just going to be things that have some sort of functional similarity. We're not going to be looking at grades in this lecture. We'll look at grades actually when we start talking about plants. Right now we're talking about clades, true common ancestor, and that makes sense, right? Ancestral protists, eumetazoans, bilateria, all of these, true common ancestor, nice monophyletic phylogeny to bork off of. So let's look at them. The first one to remember are the gastropods. So what I want you to realize is that gastropods are a type of mollusca. Mollusca are a type of Lophotrochozoa. Lophotrocha are all protostomes. They're all bilateral. They're all eumetazoan, and they all come from an ancestral protist. Be very comfortable doing what I just did there. So gastropods. This is going to be shown in figure 33.17. And what to know about gastropods? These are mostly marine, so that's their habitat, something we'll usually do a lot in the beginning of describing these animals. Mostly marine, some of them are in freshwater, so we'll say some freshwater, and also some are terrestrial. And terrestrial just means on land. Okay, Mostly marine, some freshwater, some terrestrial. They are essentially going to be those who are snails with shells is a good three-word description of gastropods. Snails with shells. And these shells are, of course, a result of this soft body being covered by the carbonate shell, calcium carbonate shell released and secreted by the mantle, right? So we're applying this knowledge that we established prior. Snails with shells would be mostly what we would consider here. Um, and more specifically, this would consist of things like slugs and uh, sea slugs also with no shells are also part of gastropods. Slugs plus sea slugs with no shells. So now, basically what we're looking at here are the snails and slugs of the world. They follow the gastropods uh, grouping, clade, of mollusca. And that's shown in figure 33.17. Take a look at that to get a better visualization. So we have things that with shells and without shells. Don't get tripped up on that. Uh, another group of, another clade, I should say, that we should study and understand are the bivalves. Okay, so remember I said snails, slugs, I covered those. What about the oysters and clams? And that's where we're going to put our bivalves actually. This will include things that are uh, like clams, mussels even, and uh, oysters. Mussels and oysters. So what are the characteristics to remember about the bivalves? Here, uh, in terms of environment, habitat, we are usually going to see these in marine and freshwater habitats. So it's not limited to the ocean or freshwater. They have unique two-part shells that really define them. And these unique two-part shells are uh, going to be hinged. They're, it's a hinged shell. If you've ever seen a clam or an oyster, you know that it closes shut and opens because of this hinge that it has. And there are two parts to it. And the reason why it has this is because this is secreted by the mantle. And why is the mantle secreting this? It's because on the inside there's a soft body, and that soft body contains a visceral mass. It contains a very muscular foot that it uses to reach out and grab things. A uh, very nice YouTube thing is to look at clam eating or, moist, or uh, oyster uh, eating. Their habits are very, very interesting based off of the structure that they possess. Again, I want to reiterate, these guys have no radula. Exception to the rule, no radula, no uh, radula that can scrape up food, no belt of teeth. Do not forget that. Always a question, at least, on remembering this no radula idea. And then finally, these guys are, because they don't scrape up food, they actually suspend food and eat it. They are suspension feeders. Suspension feeders in the sense that they trap particles uh, of food in the environment. Okay? Trap particles of food from environment. So they open their mouth, get some water within it, and uh, they figure out that there's some sort of food that they like and they trap it. 
and they trap it because they have this two-part shell that can hinge close. Uh, thus the name, by two valve, two hinges, right? Or uh, two shells, essentially. Okay, so those are our bivalves. And then finally, last one, these are my favorite, actually, the cephalopods. These guys are very, very smart, cephalopods. Thus the name cepha, meaning head, right? Um, cephalo, referring to the head region, okay? Now, the reason why they're all called pods, actually, is because of this structure right here. Very muscular foot. That foot in uh, a Greek term would be podia or pod. And so these guys all have these very muscular feet. Bivalves do as well, but not to the same extent, thus they don't have the pod in their name. Just so that you know where this comes from. Cephalo refers to head, right? Head region or development of head region. These are going to be things like squids and octopi, which are both very, very smart organisms, but very, very ancient organisms as well. Cephalopods are usually uh, specifically found in marine environments, so we're not looking at fresh water anymore. They are very good at capturing and ingesting prey. Very good predators. Capture plus ingest prey. The reason why they're so good at it is because they have those modifications, those tentacles, right? Squids and octopus, they have those tentacles to capture and ingest their prey. Um, and specifically, I want to make sure that we remember this, that they are, more generally speaking, predatory animals. Okay? They are, because of this, they are predatory animals, so you can even extend that knowledge over there. Um, more so, you can also remember that they have a mouth, and their mouth is literally their radula. Their mouth is their radula, so they have this radula structure, and that specifically will be in the form of two very strong beaks. And this is shown in your textbook when you look at the figure of the cephalopods, these two strong beaks that they possess. And finally, I already sort of spoiled this, but they have those modified feet, or modified foot structure, I should say. And because of that, we turn this into a, a nice evolutionary tool known as tentacles, right? Nice tool to get your food. Um, tentacles will be present for food capture. and also object handling. So they're actually able to manipulate their environment if necessary. Why would they want to manipulate it? Well, that's because they have these big, strong, big smart brains. Um, whenever you see an octopus, right, you see it as that large structure in the middle, and then you have the tentacles that go outwards from here, right? Worst octopus ever. But here, you have this large head structure, thus the name cephalo, and then you have the pods, the feet, right? Right over here, modified into tentacles. Um, don't worry about this diagram. And that covers our phylum mollusca. Large phylum, very uh, important to remember the characteristics, these one, two, three, sometimes four with the mantle, and the specific types of mollusca um, that are seen within marine and freshwater uh, and even terrestrial environments. Very expensive, very important phylum to remember.